here at 9 o'clock. On Monday at 18.30 is a financial peace university that's held in the fellowship hall. Tuesday, 1600, intercessory prayer, prayer in the small chapel. Please come out. It is an absolute blessing. If you won't continue and have a uh, greater relationship with God, then I'm, that is the place to be. I mean, we should be praying at home, but also coming here in the house of God and praying. Intercessory prayer is awesome. Wednesday, 17, gospel praise team uh, here in the chapel, 1800. The youth praise dance in the choir room, 1800. Also, adult Bible studies held in a small chapel. On Thursdays at 1700, gospel children's choir in the main chapel. I'm telling you, we have a good time. The kids pick the songs, and we just sing them. And we have really a blessed time. And I love it because I'm a kid at heart anyway, so I'm there having fun. On Saturday, at 10 o'clock, gospel children choir also practice on that day, and it is awesome, it's fun. Get your calendar there in the back, it'll keep you in line with what's going on. Hang on your refrigerator, put it by your desk, put it somewhere to remind you of the services that we have, so if you want to come out, you can attend, amen? So go ahead and give a hand clap of praises and praises to come forth this morning.
So, Father, we give you the glory, God, as we understand that you have given us the victory. You have made us overcome. And we bless your holy name. Bless the families, God, each and every one that's here right now. Send your angels, God, to the states of wherever their families are, Father. Bless them 100-fold, God. Send a word to them that they may also have an opportunity, God, to live holy in 2015. Send a word, Father. Hallelujah. We know that you can do, even if we can. Father, we pray this prayer, God, in your precious Son's name, Father. We just thank you. We can't thank you enough for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Give God a hand, God.
Um, but it also means that I have to eat healthy. And sometimes meat and potatoes is really, really good to have, but we need to have the veggies. Um, and if I were going to classify the message that we have today, it's the veggies. It's not necessarily the stuff that we want to hear, but it's important for us to hear. So we're going to be talking about legacy. Please turn with me. If you're there already, just follow along with me as I read 1 Samuel chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. It says this, That same day a Benjamin ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road watching because he... His heart feared for the ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, What is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes were so set that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled before it this very day. Eli asked, what happened, my son? The men who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. <clears throat> when he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the, road, by the, side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for he was an old man in heaven. He had led Israel 40 years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. And when she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. And as she was dying, the woman attending her said, Don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband, she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. Father, I am concerned uh, about the state of the church. Not the state of our relationship with you, but the state of the institutional church. And, and Father, I, I'm concerned because I question as to whether the glory has been called. And I pray, God, that it has been. I ask, God, that you would, through this test, this text, Show us what our true legacy will be. God, like I said before, this is not necessarily an easy message. It's definitely not candy, but it is definitely healthy. So please, Father, be glorified in each life today. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have a clip for you this morning. Go ahead, Mr. Lee. I don't know where you're getting your information, but uh, it wasn't my biggest shot. What do you remember about your dad? Huh? He was cold. He was calculating. He never told me he loved me. He never even told me he liked me. So it's a little tough for me to digest when you're telling me he said the whole future was right on me. He's passing it down. I don't get that. You're talking about a guy who's happy to stay when he should be off the boarding school. That's not true. Well, and clearly, you know, my dad better than I did. As a matter of fact, I did. Sorry about the technical problem there, we're right into a little screen opportunity. What do you remember about your dad? Um, was he the father that you'd always looked hoped for? Um, were you proud of him? Was he someone that you could look up to? Was he respected? Did he lead your family? Did he love your mom? Sons, did he come to your baseball games or your basketball games? 
Uh, did he play cats with you? Did he help you, or did you help him fix the truck? Was he your hero? Daughters, did he take you on dates? Did he teach you about good little boys? Did he dance with Cinderella? Did he wipe your tears? Did he make you laugh? In short, what legacy, what psychological inheritance did your father give you? Did he protect your self-worth? Did he add a positive self-image to you and a positive self-esteem? Did he give you a sense of identity and belonging? Dads, what will your children, what will your grandchildren remember about you? What legacy will you leave them? What are the blessings that they will reap and the battles they will have to face because of your relationship with God? Our legacy is the only thing that we will leave. The question is, what will you do? And this brings me to my key idea. So if you're taking notes and you want to write this down, I, I encourage you, I, I love this key idea. It's, it basically says this. It says, let your love for Jesus be the legacy you lead your family. Yes. Amen. Let your love for Jesus be the legacy that you lead your family. So let me give you a little bit of background about what's going on in the context here in, in, in this passage. Eli is God's spokesman, spokesman to the nation. He's been senior pastor for a while, basically about 40 years, and his sons are immoral. They're wicked men. They're abusive leaders in the church. I want to context this thing. They're abusive leaders in the church. Here's, here's the next thing. Okay? They were openly committing adultery in the church. Okay? They, they had established this religious mafia for the, ex, uh, for the extortion of people in the church. What had happened was this. Whenever, whenever somebody would bring their offering, <clears throat> they had to bring a certain sum of meat. Now, they were supposed to boil off the fat and stuff like this, and then they put it in this big pruning fork, and that's how the, the priests got their food. But before then, what they do, what Hoffman and Fisney and Phineas did, was they got the young guys. Now, when it says young guys, it's not talking about youth, you know, adolescent, pre-adolescent. It's talking about guys in their mid-twenties. So fairly fit individuals. Okay? And when people would show up with their offering, they would say, no, we don't want you to boil it. The priests don't want boiled meat. What we're going to do is you show me what you got, we'll take what we want. And so they were violating the instructions of God. They had set up this little mafia for the purpose, of, the purpose of extorting people their offering. And they were doing this in the church. And the problem is that Eli, senior pastor, had done nothing to address the situation. He just let it go. Next, Israel goes to war against Philistia whose territory was directly to the west of Jerusalem. So if you know where, if you got the Fertile Crescent in there, okay, I'll give you the picture. Mediterranean's like this, Israel's over here, Jerusalem's about right here, okay, and Shiloh, where Eli was, it's a little bit north, okay, but the territory of Philistia was just west of Jerusalem. So they go to war against them, but the army's not doing well. They've lost a few skirmishes, and so they call for the Ark of the Covenant to join them on the battle line. But, but when the Ark arrives, the military, they're really, really excited. Um, and there's this war that goes up there, and the Philistines are really, really uh, kind of scared about what's going on. But they don't back down. And this time, the, the idea of, oh, hey, we've got our God in the box with us, and therefore we don't have to worry, it doesn't work. And the army is defeated. As a matter of fact, 38,000 men lose their life that day. 
this day that we hear about in the beginning of our text here. The army's routed. And it brings me to my first point. Because what we see here is we see people living in fear. Look at verses 12 through 16. The point that I want you to understand is that this is a standard operational procedure. It happens every time. Whenever you have a violation of standard, you bring in shame and you bring in fear. Okay? It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Look at it yourself. When you blow it and you know that you've blown it, the first thing that you're trying to do is hide that because you are ashamed before God of what you have done and you don't want anybody else to find out about it. That's shame and that's fear. And it happens every time. Look at verse 12. It says, That same day a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, his clothes torn and dust on his head. Now this clothes torn, dust on the head combo meant that the soldier was in mourning. And in fact, the fact that he had ran from the, from the battle line meant that he had run for his life. He was scared. He was living in fear. The fact that the whole town had set up this cry, we see at that in the end of verse 13, it tells us that Shiloh was also, the entire town, was living in fear. The army was defeated. The Philistines are not that far from us. The battle line is just right over there, a few miles away. Eli also was afraid. Why? Because he knew better. He was the prophet of God. He was God's spokesman to the people. And he knew that he should have dealt with his sons, but he didn't. You got your finger right there. Keep it in, the, in 1 Samuel 4. Flip over one, one page, basically. You'll read about this in chapter 2, verse 31, because God had told the man of God, who just showed up and confronted Eli, and you can see this in, in chapter 2, verse 31, what was going to happen. Take a look at it. 2, 31. It says this. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your family line. The, this man of God told Eli it was coming. As a matter of fact, this thing is confirmed. Just go down the page there to, verse, uh, to chapter 3, verse 18. God reveals this to Samuel, what's going to happen to Eli. And Samuel's a little nervous. He's a young guy. And God's prepping him to take over. And so he shares what's about ready to happen to Eli. Look at verse 18. So Samuel told Eli, that's the him there, everything. He hid nothing from him. And Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Eli knew better. It was told to him by the man of God. It was confirmed by Samuel. And he knew that this was going to come true. He should have dealt with his sons. He knew he should have never sent the ark out under those conditions. He also should have been honest with himself, with God, and with the people. But he wasn't. And he was sitting on the side of the road by his gate, waiting for a measure of stress release that stress relief that would never come. His opportunity had passed. He was too old, and literally, he no longer was able to see what his compromise would cost his family and what it would cost the nation. This brings me to my second point. A life wasted. You find this is verse, the, the second part of verse 16 through 18. First it says there, Eli asked, what happened, my son? Now the Benjamite in verse 17 provides this report. It says that Israel fled, the army suffered great losses. Your sons are KIA, and the ark was taken. Oh, it isn't mentioned in the text, but from the two earlier passages we, we read, I think it would be appropriate, and I think the context also supports the theory that, oh, 
Eli, and you're responsible. Gentlemen, dads, we're responsible. We're responsible for how we communicate our relationship with God to our children. You know, one of the things that hurts the church right now, I'm sorry, I'm going to get in the guy's face. And when, I, when I get in your face, I look at mine first. In churches today, who are the ones that provide the primary educational training to our children in the church? It's the ladies. And you want to know what that communicates to boys? That that's not what a man is. A man doesn't go to church. A man stays home on Sundays and watches football. A man is not involved in ministry. That's what my mom does. That's what the ladies auxiliary does. That's what PWOC does. What about men? PWO men. P P M O C. Look at the demise of. Eli in verse 18, it says, When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell back off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died, for he was an old man and heavy, and he had led Israel 40 years. So he started leading Israel when he was 58 years old. That sounds familiar because I'm not 58 yet. Be close. Not 58. But this word mentioned, okay, when it says he mentioned, the word used is used 232 different times in the Old Testament, and it means this. It, it, it means to make, to remember. In other words, God caused Eli to remember what that man of God said and what was confirmed to Samuel. I also find it really interesting. Did you notice this in verse 18? It doesn't say that Eli fell back off his chair and broke his neck. It says his neck was broken. Hmm. Now, the method of demise is not the issue here. The point is, is that God took him out. And apparently he wanted to stress the fact that he was the one that did it. And this brings me to a very tough question. Are we seeing the demise of the church for the same reason? Not because we don't have rules established. Um, if you stay here long enough, you'll hear me say this over and over again. I don't promote religion. I promote relationship with God. There is a difference. Religion is a set of rules that a body of people have said, this is what we believe is necessary for us to appease God. My point is this. God already loves you. You don't have to do anything to appease him. And the point here is this, is that whatever you offer to him is not going to increase his love for you. He already loved you so much, he sent a son to die for you. Okay? What he wants is relationship with you. And that's why I don't promote religion. I promote relationship with God. I mean, how many times do we have to be told this? And I'm not saying that you can just cruise along and not come to know Jesus. Here, here, here's the text. Jesus said this, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. All right, cool, got that one. Here we go, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which you must be saved. Oh, let's go back to the favorite one. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm not saying that you don't have to come to know Jesus. You need to. But you also need to understand what 1 Peter 3, 18 says. Jesus Christ died once 
for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. For the purpose, this is what it says, to bring us to God. In John chapter 1, verse 12 says this, To as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Your father loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. I believe that it's not because we don't have the rules established. I believe this is because we're not living in the freedom that Jesus provided for us. Why? Because we're not sharing the Christ who transforms lives. I love working in the military. You know? Um, I've had opportunity after opportunity in desperate situations and somebody come in and talk to me and I say, hey, you know, what squad are you with? Are you with NAFA? Would you like to talk with me? What's your particular religious belief? Because we want to pair you up. But once they say, hey, chaps, you know, I'm really interested in what you have to say, then I can say, you want to know something? The person that makes all the difference in my life is Jesus Christ. And I'd love to introduce him to you. Got to do that appropriately. Yeah. But Jesus is the answer. It's all about him. So what legacy are you leaving your children my first opportunity after I came to know Jesus, I went to a, a, a summer camp in 1978. Um, and, uh, so I was a junior in high school, and I was excited about my faith. And I remember at this campfire on the last night, all these seniors that were graduating saying, oh, man, you know, trying to encourage you juniors coming up, you guys are going to be the leaders next year. We really should have gone for it. Wait, yeah, we didn't, we, we, we kind of cowered back, but we're trying to encourage you to, hey, really, really go for it next year. Be leaders. Leave a legacy. And so I got with Melvin, and I got with Chris, and a couple of my friends, and I said, I don't want to be able to say that next year. Knowing Jesus is the one who makes the difference. We can do rah-rah cheerleader thing. Okay? And when the event's over, it's gone. People are looking for you to be real. Not for you to be perfect. I remember reading, uh, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to see in the movie uh, Moneyball, but there's a phrase that Billy Bean uses is that if you don't win the last game this season, nobody cares. Okay? I always like this one. Um, this is one of those anonymous quotes. He who dies with the most toys still dies. Okay? Or if you want the balance off here, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, man is destined to die once and then judgment. And the word here, destined, is used only twice. It's a present Middle passive indicative third person singular, which means this it is appointed. The translation in the third person there, singular, is he has an appointment with judgment. The point is this we have a scheduled appointment to stand before God. We can either, because it's written in either the middle or the passive voice, that means that we can either respond to it, that's the middle voice, or we can let it happen, that's the passive voice. But the point there is it's still going to happen. You can deal with it, or I should say you can have Jesus deal with it, or you can deal with it yourself. The choice is yours. And this brings me to my final point, a legacy forged. You see, the mistakes that we make today will forge a legacy that we will leave tomorrow. This is Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. It says this, You shall not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or earth beneath, 
or in the waters below. You shall not bow down, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing, and we'll talk about what that word means. Punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, so what's the problem? Simple. There are those of us who think that we are going to be the exception to the rule. That we're going to beat the system. And you won't. This word punishing in the Hebrew, it's used 302 times and it means to visit upon. Now I want to explain what that means. What the text is not saying is that God is going to make our children pay for our sin. That's what we think when you read that word punishing. What it does mean is it contextualizes the fact that they will have to battle against. Remember, the point is visit upon. They will have to battle against those things that we, dads, struggle with. So what is the legacy that you want to leave your children This is a stat from the New York Times. One third of children who are abused will become abusers. One third. So what will your legacy be? Eli must have thought that he was going to beat the system. But he provides proof that God is faithful to his word. You can read about that again at the end of our chapter right there. In our, yeah, verses 19 to 21. Eli's daughter-in-law heard the news and the stress caused her to go into labor prematurely. The stress of the news with the delivery of the child actually led to her death. And as she was dying, read about this in verse 20, she fulfills God's word and proclaims the condition of the nation all in the naming of her son, Ichabod. The glory has departed. So let me wrap the message up with this. For those of us who are struggling with habitual sin, ask yourself a question. What will my legacy be? What damage am I doing to my children and what will they have to suffer through because I have chosen not to draw closer to God? What will they have to battle against because I've decided to sit on the sidelines? I'll be honest with you. I mean, I love being with you, and I consider you guys family. And some of you I've known for a long time now. But if the chapel here falls apart after I go, I have done nothing. If it falls apart after I leave, then you follow the wrong person. Because who you're supposed to follow is Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. This is my heart. Please hear it from the dad. Deal with it now. Before it becomes the legacy. Before it becomes the only thing that your children or your grandchildren remember about you. Let's pray. And as the praise team comes forward this time, I'd like to have everyone go ahead and stand. Head down and eyes closed. We're going to give an invitation. And again, I, I, I'm not angry here to have anybody look around. What we're going to do is we're going to have our ministers come forward this time. We're going to have them line up here in front of the stage. And if you want to come forward to see Jesus, I invite you to do so now. If you need to come forward with prayer, I invite you to come right now. What we're going to do is we're going to have you come up here. They're going to escort you off. The, out of the door here to my right, okay, your left, take you back to the choir room, have somebody sit down and pray with you. But as the music starts and as the praise team, we invite you to come forward. Amen. Father, through the next moments this morning, please deal with our hearts. Father, those are, there are those of us in this room that have been struggling with sin for a while. 
God, there are those of us who have been sitting on the sidelines and sworn, God, you said no longer. This is your opportunity to get this thing right. So I encourage those here, Father, to come forward, to give prayer, to receive Jesus. We praise God for our goodness in Jesus' name.